CEO of the Atlantic Council, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special edition of Atlantic Council Front Page, our premier platform for global leaders, with David Malpass, the 13th President of the World Bank. One week from today, the world's finance ministers and central bank governors will convene in Washington for the World Bank IMF Spring meetings. On the agenda will be inflation, debt challenges, stress in the banking system, the continued economic fallout from the war in Ukraine uh, is a perfect storm for global financial leaders. The World Bank this week warned of a, quote, lost decade, unquote, ahead for, the global, for global growth. Here's the operative uh, quote. It will take a Herculean collective policy effort to restore growth in the next decade to the average of the previous one. So nothing could be more fitting than to discuss the goals of these meetings with President Malpass. Uh, president Malpass has served as the President of the World Bank since 2019. He previously served as Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Finance, uh, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary and Chief Economist at Bear Stearns. But President Malpass, I think it's fair to say that no one could have imagined the scale of the challenges you would face over these last four years. Um, COVID-19 shook the world and sapped economic growth and vitality across a range of economies. In that moment of crisis, President Malpass and the talented staff of the bank sprang into action. The bank fast-tracked funding, support, funding supported vaccine rollout in, uh, that supported vaccine rollout in nearly 80 countries. Its emergency funding operations reached over 100 nations, comprising 70 percent of global GDP. The world needed help and the World Bank stepped up. In that moment, the bank lived up to the ambition of its founding in 1944. I'm reminded standing here that precisely one year ago in this room, Secretary Yellen stood on this very stage and called for a revitalization of the Bretton Woods institutions. She hearkened back to the Bretton Woods Conference, which took place during, not after the war, and some people forget that, and she told the Atlantic Council Quote, just as they did then, we ought not wait for the new normal. We should begin to shape a better future today, unquote. Our Geoeconomics Center team took that call to action. They launched the Bretton Woods 2.0 project dedicated to building a stronger international financial system for the decades ahead. Through their research, writing, events, and interactive data visualization, they are mapping a new way forward. And they accelerated their work on a range of issues from sanctions to digital currencies to the shifting contours of Chinese economy. Many of these issues now shape uh, the agenda for the finance ministers and governors uh, in the week ahead. There'll be a healthy debate, as there should be, about the future of Bretton Woods institutions. But the one thing ministers will agree on, and as the last few years have shown clearly, is that the world needs the World Bank. And President Malpass, I want to take a moment to thank you for your strong and steady leadership at, of this crucial institution at this historic moment. To moderate this special edition of Atlantic Council Front Page, we have one of the absolute best in the financial journalism business, Le Lisa Abramowitz, the co-host of Bloomberg Surveillance. Anyone here who starts uh, and anyone not just here in this in-person audience, but in our uh, huge global virtual audience, uh, I'm sure a lot of them, Lisa, are your fans and followers. Anyone here who starts their day listening to Lisa and her colleagues is better informed for it. Her expertise on markets, global capital flows, and the inner workings of the U.S. banking system are second to none. So President Malpass and Lisa, uh, with this robust in-person audience and a very large global virtual audience, 
I turn the floor to you. Thank you so much. That was truly wonderful. And honestly, it is a privilege to be on a stage with someone who is at the epicenter of so many of the preeminent issues of the moment. Um, this marks year four, I believe, your fourth anniversary at the helm of the World Bank. And we're coming up to a unique 12 months ahead. What do you view as your major concern, the dominant one, for the next 12 months? Thank you. Thanks to Atlantic Council. Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it, it's got, I think, growth is the big problem. As you, or as you think about the number of young people that need jobs, uh, achieving that is really important. It's a little different in the U.S. where the participation rate is lower and where there has been uh, job growth and a low unemployment rate. But in much of the world, in fact, I'll say most of the world, there is a shortage of jobs. And so how do you really get back to a spot where people are moving ahead? We've talked about the reversal of development. You know, the in many parts of the world over these last few years, it's been going backwards in terms of their median income, in terms of poverty, in terms of education, health, and climate uh, complicates it all. One of the reasons why what you do is, is uh, pretty amazing is you take these 30,000 feet views of the macro economy and you bring them down to the details of how one person gets a job in a country that has its own challenges. How is the challenge different now as we exit decades of zero interest rates? The idea that suddenly money costs something and that's changing the allocation of money. Yeah. This is a huge change and I really think and want top world leaders have to focus on this that for 10 years rates were zero and now they're not. They're back to more normal uh, levels and the dislocation is huge. It's going, it still is rippling through the world. That means as a contract expires and you try to roll over, you're rolling over at a much, much higher interest rate than where you were at before. So from the standpoint of growth strategy for countries, uh, this is, a, this is a, a new and very stressful. I made that point in a sp speech uh, four or five days ago in Niger. So it's in the center of, it's, uh, it's twice as big as Texas. It's uh, sitting in the, in the Sahel region of uh, Africa. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the uh, urging that I gave is uh, to not wait for the world to come, that there needs to be really change in the country and do as much as you can because the, the next few years are going to be stressful. As Fred was saying, it may, we don't want it to be a lost decade for growth. Can you talk about the World Bank in terms of its role when you are lobbying for certain changes and offering money to, to attach to it? How it's changed over the past four years as people talk more about splintering globalization, fragmentation. Has the role of the World Bank changed? W what we've tried to do is focus on what's going to be a good outcome for the people of the country. And so four years ago, it was pre-COVID and, pre and interest rates were zero. And so you could really think in terms of how the country could attract euro bond offerings. Uh, you know, quite a few of the, even the poorest countries in the world were borrowing through London in the euro bond market. That's all closed. In fact, not only is London basically closed for these countries, but their regional markets are closing and bank lending has been, the bank bar, governments borrowing from their own banks has been stretched to the limit. Uh, and so that means there has to be a, a new system that they're thinking about in terms of how, where's the growth going to come from. W one of the one of the challenges is people look at it and say, we used to grow 4%, so we'll probably grow 4%. It's a revert to mean kind of concept that people think about, but why, why would that be possible if interest rates have gone to zero and, and, and now, which was abnormal? Historically, that was a unique period, unlikely to really ever return. And so then how, how do you, uh, how, then there, we shouldn't think of the world in terms of a business cycle or a revert to mean. It's got to be uh, an, an inflection point into some new growth uh, uh, model. And we'll get into <clears throat> what that looks like and what the consequences are 
Is it harder to raise money right now from the World Bank constituents than it was when you started at the World Bank? Uh, it's the same, which is part of the problem. So if we look back over the last 30 years or so, uh, the, the actual contributions, cash contributions from shareholders and from donors has been relatively flat, even in nominal terms. So we talk about IDA growing, and I, I've gone through two giant IDA fundraising. In 2020, we concluded, uh, well, 2019, we concluded uh, IDA 19. The numbers get mixed up because we've got a three-year cycle going on a calendar uh, cycle. So, But in 2019, we concluded IDA 19 at uh, some $82 billion. And then because of COVID, we accelerated the next fundraising and made it a two-year cycle rather than three. The first time in history that's been done. It was done very successfully. So it was 90 $93 billion for IDA 20, which we're now uh, dispersing in terms of grants and loans to the poorest countries. So that was a giant success. But underneath that, how did you get from 82 to 93? There were no more donations from the from the advanced from the advanced economies. We leveraged the existing uh, balance sheet more in order to make that expansion. So when you really look back, one of the challenges is there hasn't been much increase in o uh, overseas development assistance, ODA, the famous acronym for generosity from the countries. In fact, many of them have reduced it. So this is a challenge for the world when their countries are facing more costs than before and yet the, the actual, even in nominal terms, it's been pretty flat. So the U.S., for example, con is the biggest and most generous contributor to the World Bank, and we are super grateful for that. But it's a flat nominal contribution, you know, 1.3 and then $1, $1 billion per year, 1.2. Uh, so it's staying flat in nominal terms. And that's the best of, uh, of our supporters. How much of that is because nations are going out and doing it on their own? And I think about China having their own strategic development program to try to, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, to try to lend to developing markets on their terms. How much is that a part of the perhaps flat uh, contributions from the members? It's partly that, but even on their bilateral aid, countries haven't been growing it very much. And I should note, China has substantially increased its contribution to the World Bank. For example, IDA, they've gone from 600 million to 1.2 billion in IDA 19. That was my my first fundraising, and then 1.4 billion in the uh, in the uh, Ida 20. So they've been expanding, which is uh, very well received by the World Bank. Um, so that I'm sorry, I've used two apples and oranges. The U.S. contribution is, a, is say, a billion, really 1.2 billion per year, so that adds to 3 billion over a three-year period, and China's putting in 1.4 billion over a three-year period. So the U.S. is a much bigger donor, but China has, uh, uh, and it's appreciated, has expanded its contribution to the bank, and in its bilateral aid, it's also expanding. But other countries aren't so much. And so from the standpoint of developing countries, what they feel is a composition shift toward China. So you said that it's well received by the World Bank for uh, China to be getting involved. Why is it good? Some people push back and say it's suspect. Uh, they're the third biggest shareholder of the bank. So from a pure governance standpoint, they have a seat on the board and I and participate and do it in a, in a r r constructive way. Uh, and so we want, and they're, they're uh, the world's second biggest economy. So to have a multilateral institution, there needs to be some component of China's uh, involvement and engagement. So, uh, you know, we welcome that. And then we work with them on things that they can do to make to have a better impact on development and on the global economy specifically transparency so within china's system there's been uh, a difference in terms of how they do contracts that affects intellectual property trade and very much their lending to other countries as they go into uh, developing countries often they have been in the habit 
of doing non-disclosure clauses in the contract. So the contract says, I'm lending to you the government of country X, uh, but this contract can never be shown to anyone. And some of them are written so tightly, they can't be shown to the IMF or the World Bank or to the ministers, other ministers within that same government. So it's a, it's a uh, un unique contracting relationship. We've uh, asked and invited them uh, not to put that clause in their contracts. Uh, they also are uh, in the habit of uh, uh, asking collateral from countries, which is very hard for a government to give collateral because it lasts longer than the life of, of, the, gov of the sitting government and escrow accounts. I'll, so I'm naming three practices that we've worked specifically to uh, encourage them not to put into their contracts. They're also doing swap lines from central banks. So these are all complicated issues, but they're really important. We're talking billions and billions of dollars that are flowing with insufficient transparency. So that's a high priority uh, as the world interacts with China in a global context. How do you argue for them to possibly play ball at a time when they have a particular objective to get a certain alliance of countries uh, and there is a different objective for the World Bank, which is trying to help generate growth in the world. I mean, it's just directly in conflict, no? I, I hope no, and we make that case directly to them. I went in December. Uh, Kristalina was, uh, the, Georgieva, the, the uh, managing director of the IMF, was there last week with, uh, with uh, uh, Axel von Trotzenberg, the, the, the uh, uh, managing director, senior managing director within the World Bank. And so the, and the, so the, the, uh, the, the our, our, what, what we want China to see is that it's strongly in its interest to see the world growing. And, the, the, and so that can be done through a difference in lending practices, also faster restructuring of debt. So make the direct case to them. China is right now so in December, when I was there, I was one of the first ones in uh, as they as they lifted the quarantines and uh, and the lockdowns for COVID. Uh, we had uh, good meetings with the previous premier. They've changed just last month to a new premier. The previous premier said the Politburo has decided on an opening strategy to accelerate China's opening. So we embrace that ask them to put that into fruition in Sri Lanka, in various uh, uh, country uh, debt situations and also in trade relationships. Uh, and so now the new premier has, uh, has uh, underscored that, that China is looking for a way to accelerate their opening to the world. So the world uh, can embrace that. We can at the, at the World Bank and we do. At a time of so much transition, as we go into the next decade and you talk about much slower growth, what are the tangible consequences of a potential global recession and, and substantially slower growth in the years to come? Part of it is migration. People move to where the jobs are. So if their country is in a deeper recession, people move, and that creates its own set of challenges. We have a big report coming out on that. And of course, Europe and the US and other uh, recipient countries of m migrants uh, feel those consequences, so that's one. And another is on the financial side. The government's uh, financial deficits, fiscal deficits, are ballooning. And so debt to GDP ratios are going up when you really need them to be there. They were already at a high level due to COVID. So you go to a, to a even higher level after COVID. That's a, that's a challenge for world financial markets. Do you really want to keep lending into governments that are expanding their debt? Um, and so those are two direct consequences. Well, that's a great question. How do you get confidence and how do you convince the members of the uh, World Bank that you're putting their money to good use and then it's going to come back to them if the countries are becoming much less creditworthy? Uh, w one is inside the World Bank, I've tried and, and really had the World Bank try to practice fiscal discipline. So some lead by example is, uh, is needed. In the countries, we've really, uh, we're working to beef up our uh, uh, public expenditure reviews. That means helping the governments uh, think about how they're spending money so that they can save on the, on the edges. Uh, and so that, that's 
an approach to dealing with the reality of the world. I interest rates aren't zero anymore. There's not a new flow of debt coming in. So there's going to have to be a way to increase productivity. I was in Togo uh, three days ago. It's a small country on the, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea on the west coast, French West Africa, uh, but important. It's got a large World Bank program and they are short of fertilizer because world markets have really been stretched by, the, by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so that still is rippling through global markets, shortages of key components or prices that are too high for farmers in, in poor countries to afford. So World Bank helped them finance, but it finance fertilizer imports so that the farmers can meet this crop season. The, uh, you know, it's vital as you begin to plant crops, farmers won't plant and do the work if there's not fertilizer because their, product, their yields will be too low. So we're helping with that. Uh, I forget where that question started, but it's the very practical on the ground problem that the countries are facing in a slow world growth environment. Yeah, how you work and try to just determine whether the loans are actually going to uh, pay dividends, and it's the relationships that you have with some of the officials as well. It comes at a tricky time, and you did mention Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and the fallout of that is pretty widespread, commodities in particular. The latest is that OPEC Plus is going to cut the production uh, of oil by more than a million, million, excuse me, a million barrels a day. You've seen oil prices go up. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing for your, uh, the nations that you lend to? I think it's a bad thing. Some are oil exporters, so for them they reap some benefit. But from the standpoint of global growth, energy costs are a big component of that. And there's, uh, you know, uh, there's arbitrage between oil prices, natural gas prices, coal prices. So basically the whole energy complex goes up in price, which means uh, harder for a farmer to get yields on crops. They can't afford the, the raw materials that they use. As, as you look around the world, at, you know, natural gas is a, a vital component for the whole agricultural cycle because it's used to make the fertilizer and then uh, to to uh, that that creates the the yields that farmers need. So as oil prices, I mean, my mind goes to the practical aspect. If oil prices go up, uh, farmers are going to ha be planting less, and so we have to think about food prices next year. Uh, and this gets to this uh, uh, difficult spot. For if the poor people in the world, in both the, poor people are in both advanced economies, middle income countries, and the poorest countries, wherever they are, they then feel that when a price goes up, that means they can't use that product. Uh, so they trade down to uh, less useful fertilizer or to food that one of the concerning trends in the world is they're trading down in terms of the quality of the protein that they're eating. So what we're seeing is uh, as the longer this uh, period goes on of high prices for energy, what's happening is Farmers are using less fertilizer, so that means next year's yields will be less. There's a, there's a building component in soil. And then the same thing even for human beings. If you're using less uh, protein, your health is going to suffer next year and the following year. And that w the data is clear that's happening. And that has all sorts of effects, both human and uh, from a macroeconomic perspective. You know, you talk about higher oil prices, higher food prices, and that leads people to just buy less of it, right? Which has created this debate as a disinflationary almost to have higher commodity prices. Do you think that low growth will eventually mean low inflation? Or could you see low growth and high inflation? Are you expecting a stagflationary next decade? I think we've been in stagflation. We, that was our uh, World Bank report a year ago that was, uh, that was early on that call, that we have a stag stagflation period, meaning stubbornly high inflation, even though low growth is going to be low. Now, fortunately, the U.S. and China did, did, uh, were able to put together uh, some aspects of growth and have seen some rebound. So that's helped uh, the world. But there needs to be much, much more production and productivity in order to break out of stagflation. My own view also is that part of inflation, and if you think about the 1970s for you know the, the, the hyperinflation of those decades, that 
it, it's very connected to what's happening to currency values. So in the 70s, the value of the dollar collapsed. So the price of everything in dollars, denominated in dollars, went up. So you can think of it as a monetary, you know, people kind of analyze it as monetary and fiscal policy, but we really ought to bring in currency policy. Um, so right now we see the dollar is pretty strong, and so there's no reason to think of it being a hyperinflation cycle, uh, but we have to see that inflation is stubborn while, uh, while the, the, the high levels of government spending are continuing. All right, so let's build on this currency uh, question yeah. for a minute, especially because some people are saying you are starting to see signs that the dollar is losing sort of the U.S. exceptionalism crown that had been given to it. Do you see that in actuality when you are lending? Do you feel that with respect to the reserve currencies that countries are holding? Um, I would say no. And I'm not one who's so worried about the dollar, the U.S. preserving the reserve status of the dollar. You, you earn that by dependability and by uh, how fast can you trade, a, the, trade the currency. The, the efficiency of markets is critical, and the U.S. still has dominance in that. Now, but that's certainly what's under question marks from, from uh, blockchain kinds of uh, uh, currencies. The, the uh, Chinese currency is now part of the SDR, so it's become, it's got the potential to grow as a reserve currency. I lived through, though, in the uh, uh, 1980s as the euro was forming, and people were worried about the euro taking space from the dollar. Uh, and then uh, I was at a hearing. Alan Greenspan explained carefully, look, competition is good for a currency. Uh, so it's OK for the euro to form, and we'll compete with them for value. And so that turned out to be the right, uh, the right analysis, that the dollar stood up to the euro, and so it was uh, maybe helping both sides. So I want to think of it that way, but then that's incumbent on the U.S. to really have strong financial, or to have financial strength so that the dollar can remain uh, the, the world's most important currency. Does China view it that way? That it's basically, uh, you know, it's not a zero-sum game and that there are lots of reserve currencies and they want the renminbi to be part of that. Or is this more of a currency war a bit and trying to replace and immunize from potential sanctions, retaliation, et cetera, like what we've seen from Russia? Time will tell some on that. I, my thought is China really likes to compete. So they're competing right now for tourism. It's very interesting. You know, as they've un unlocked uh, from, from COVID, <clears throat> one of their growth industries is they want people to come back and visit China, and they want Chinese people to, to do tourism around China, uh, recognizing that that's a pretty good growth industry. So they're competing on a range. Think of it in big data, in uh, uh, telecom, in chips, and so on across the board. And, th and they've been explicit in that. We want to compete with the world and be the best in the world. And, and so there's some of that on the currency. And then I think it, some of the burden then comes back to the US. Uh, okay, you can try that, but we've got better systems, better ability to uh, have have turnover within our com our companies. You know, one of the biggest uh, strengths of the U.S. is the ability to fail. So as companies fail, there's a bankruptcy process, and then the currency, the capital is liberated, and it goes to some other company that has a better idea. Uh, and so the U.S. has a better system and can compete. Uh, in in uh, with China in that uh, con in that con in that that contest. When deciding who to lend to, you were talking about the needs with respect to fertilizer and making sure that uh, that residents aren't malnourished. Also supporting the en energy infrastructure. Do you decide to lend more to countries that are showing signs of being run better, having less corruption, being able to implement? plans with the money that you are able to deliver? Or do you fo are you forced almost by your mandate to be an equal opportunity lender and to go for the weakest hands? That's a great question. You have to come inside the, the World Bank to, uh, to think about that. What we, one other aspect, so we, you can say, do you lend or not lend? But there's really a blend where do you lend toward projects that are long-term projects or fast dispersing money? And that gets, either, uh, Fred's opening was about the Bretton Woods system and 
Where should it go? Uh, and there is the liquidity needs of countries. Do you need the money in the next year? And then there's the longer-term growth uh, needs. Do you need development where you're building schools and you're uh, uh, hiring teachers and you're improving health systems in the country? And what's the balance between those two? And right now, there's financial stress. So there's a lot of pressure on the World Bank to just lend the money to the country, even if they're not doing well, to participate in the liquidity of the country. And so I. I didn't want to answer straight away to you. What we are trying to do is those countries that are not reforming their system in a way that gives confidence about their sustainability, their growth. We still operate in the countries, but we tend to do it more with social safety nets, it have direct assistance to the people of the country uh, so that they can uh, survive the shortages of food that are upon them. So we have big operations in East Africa, for example, where they're confronted by drought uh, and uh, by high prices. And so that means food assistance and also assistance to the farmers so that they w can be planting. Well, I mean, the reason why I ask partly is because when I think about Bretton Woods 2.0, like Jenny Yellen was talking about, I wonder, what's the objective of this new global consortium to lend? Is it to you know, basically have a humanitarian focus to bring up uh, some of the weaker links? Is it to say to a country that could potentially be part of a supply chain for the developed world, hey, we want to support your infrastructure and make sure you guys have good business so that you can profit and also so that we can profit? I mean, how do you parse out the different motivations of nations that are, you know, legitimate for their own good while also kind of preserving this, this sort of humanitarian focus, which was at the foundation of the organization? Uh, the, human, the, the, uh, the original Bretton Woods was mostly about rebuilding from World War II. So the World Bank, the original World Bank was the IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And the first loans were to France and to Luxembourg and, to, and then in, in, in a diversification to Chile. So countries that we think of as middle or higher income now. So that, that's, a, that's a core issue of, okay, what is your purpose? And I, I think there's a clear enough purpose, IMF trying to, to stabilize the international financial system and liquidity kinds of challenges, World Bank trying to, uh, try, trying to push forward with development, uh, which includes sustainable development. So bring in uh, the climate costs that are so immense. I was, uh, as I said, in Niger which is in the Sahel zone and uh, very difficult environment from the from the costs of climate changes going on in the Sahel so those are those are concepts our board just has gone through a really a three month uh, in, encouraged by the US which we welcome uh, we, we've done a f three four five month uh, uh, dive through our board of directors and their capitals. So this is the broad membership of the bank thinking about what role, uh, what, what, are the, what are the primary purposes and reinforcing the idea that poverty reduction and uh, uh, poverty alleviation, including in middle income countries is an important high priority of the bank and also boosting prosperity, shared income in the context of sustainability. So I think there's a clear mission and role. Uh, the hard part is uh, the world's not a welcoming place for developing countries right now. And the people, importantly, a woman in a poor developing country, think of how difficult, the difficulties she's facing. Her children don't have schools to go to. There may not be a road. Uh, there's not electricity. Water, clean water means kids walking in, in Niger, where I was, a, a big problem is they are still using wood to, to burn for charcoal to make to the food on a daily basis. Well, you, 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 know, you can strip the land of a lot of wood. The kids are needed and don't go to school, stay home because you have to hunt for wood around the, the greater community area. I don't want to you know, th these are really challenging times. So how do you help a country break out of that into cooking that's cleaner from the environment standpoint and uses less hours, particularly of women? Do you think that we've moved forward 
in the past five years or have kind mm -hmm. of stayed the same or moved backwards? I, I'm afraid we've, our data shows the reversal in development. That means poverty is higher maybe than five years ago, uh, that education and uh, literacy problems are worse than they were five years ago. That's the combination of COVID uh, and now of the high prices coming out of, uh, of the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So you end up with a double whammy. We've tried to meet that from the World Bank side uh, by big expansion of our lending both in IBRD but also in IDA. As I described, this faster cycle that we've done for IDA has allowed 30 percent expansion by the World Bank record levels of commitments that we're doing in the world, but it's a fraction of what's needed. So given that, <clears throat> What's your optimism level that we're going to try to make inroads over the next 10 years? Do you think that it looks likely or do you think we're going to keep going backwards? That's the, the, the report that's out, that if you look at things today, the challenge is that there may not be progress and we need to avoid that lost decade. That means push hard on debt restructuring, which we're doing. I'm working daily to try to get to some kind of, to break the stalemate that's gone on in uh, the highly indebted countries so that they have a path forward. Uh, we want to push on more resources from the World Bank, so we're doing within our evolution process this uh, expand we're, we're, we've the the board's reached agreement uh, and uh, to allow uh, an increase in the leverage of IBRD the one one part of the World Bank will be going into a new Ida cycle for fundraising so the World Bank can do some parts of this but then uh, I I think a lot of it has to do with the global growth environment that gets straight into deposit insurance into fiscal and monetary stimulus and also regulatory policies across the advanced economies. I mean, we have to see that we are in a world where we can worry about people in developing countries, which I do, uh, but the, 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 uh, the giant challenge is almost all of the capital in the world is staying in the advanced economies and is used to pay the national debt and is used to pay the, the corporate bond payments as they come due. And it's not at a spot where it's creating new, uh, uh, new opportunities for the world. And so that's a challenge for the world over the next five years. As interest rates have gone to a more normal level, are you going to, how many years are you going to go through an adjustment in asset prices and in capital allocation uh, in, before you can get back to a, a broad-based growth model for the world? How does deposit insurance fit into that? Well, uh, banks are critical to growth. They lend to small businesses. So one of the underpinnings of a successful banking system is people are comfortable putting their deposits in banks. And if you shake that, uh, so deposits move into a narrower group at the top, bigger banks, uh, money market funds. Uh, who's going to lend to uh, small businesses? This is a giant problem for Europe and has been for 10 years. There's just not dynamism at the small business level. So do you think, and this is something that is being uh, heatedly debated, hotly debated in the markets, that the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and a couple other smaller uh, banks in the U.S., regional banks, does have a systemic effect that will essentially restrict lending not just to small businesses in the U.S., but exacerbate what you're seeing in the developing world as well? And I want to uh, parse the word systemic effect. So the, the, uh, the, is it a systemic risk for the system? Maybe the regulators have been able to address that. Are there follow-on effects? Uh, I, I think clearly yes. It makes it, it so each, each person with deposits in banks examines that, checks the safety, uh, and there's a migration toward the, uh, toward the bigger banks. I would argue we, the U.S. Uh, but it's also true in, in all of the advanced economies that there's this huge value in small and uh, regional banks and, and community, even community banks because of the relationship with their, with their customers. Small businesses that need an inventory loan, an accounts receivable loan, auto loans, truck truck loans, that's, you know, the lifeblood of uh, small commerce is the ability to finance a truck through a finance company or a lease. So that has to be maintained, and there needs to be explicit policies to do that. All things being equal, do you think that the risk of a global recession has gone up over the past three weeks? 
Yes, but you know, there's always some risk of a recession, and so on the cha mar change on the margin is what we're seeing. So you've seen uh, short-term, two-year two-year Treasury yields came down quite a bit as people worried about the fragility of the system. So on the one hand, that's good because we want uh, lower interest rates, but of course, don't we want it in the context of fast, fast growth? Uh, that, I mean, that's explicit on that you you've got to replace stagflation with Lots more production at a lower interest rate. That gives you the growth of the future. So you're coming up to the end of your <clears throat> tenure at the World Bank as the president. What would you, what advice would you give the next president of the World Bank? Uh, uh, um, you be very engaged in the in the countries that are the the uh, the borrowers or the recipients of grants from the from the uh, uh, bank. You can, one could use one's time 100% in conferences in the advanced economies, but that's not really where the action is. The action is how do you, how do you convince countries to make the changes that they need? One, one that's related uh, to, to climate change is adaptation. We, we are doing a series of reports that are specific country by country what they can do to protect for the future. One thing is move people, don't, don't have the population growth on the floodplain. So it sounds obvious, very difficult for countries to do that because the people want to move to where there is land available, often on a floodplain. So how do you set up policies to really guide in a better direction? Those are all you know, real uh, challenges for the daily operation of the bank. What are you the most proud of over the past four years? Um, it was very nice in Fred's introduction to mention uh, multiple crises, and I think we did, the bank w had, had good leadership. I've been really proud of the senior people in the bank. Um, for, for example, as COVID hit, uh, we needed a faster process of getting loans through. You know, the bank it, uh, puts each loan through the board. Think how cumbersome that was. So we arranged uh, a, or got authority from the bank, uh, from the board, to put uh, similar loans through without as, uh, without as uh, much intervention. And so that way we could do 100 countries. How can you do 100 loans through a board of directors? And we did it very quickly, a lot of money put out, so that helped, and same, same with others. We, we tried to respond uh, fast to crises and have people around the bank working. So you think, think of what the bank's doing. We have people in countries all over the world that are, some of whom are in lockdowns, others who are not. So how do you have a, enough variation within your policies internally that people are getting the job done? Meaning the, the paperwork, but it's not paperwork, it's not really a bureaucracy situation, is how do you interact with government ministers when everybody's in lockdown? Well, we, we managed to continue that and successfully. Do you have any regrets? Uh, n no regrets other than what we've just been talking about. You know, I, I've uh, worked for so long on development, and so it's, it's challenging to me personally to see any backward movement. I started uh, with the U.S. government in 1984 on the same development issues we've been discussing and have done that throughout. And so I really envision a world where people uh, get ahead, where median incomes for median incomes so that means you've got to have people at the bottom being pulled up rapidly uh, um, or themselves opportunities for them to go upward. And that's been stalled right now. So I really think we ought to all be working on how do we break through that uh, logjam stalemate. I see there are a lot of uh, questions from the audience. Before we get to them, do you want to give us a sneak peek to where you're going next? Huh. Well, um, I'm exploring opportunities. I, you know, I've I've been uh, in the U.S. Uh, and and in government uh, public posts for 15 years, but private sector much more. So I'm I'm eager to get uh, back to the private sector. That's where I'm very comfortable, and so I'll, I'm looking forward to that and just exploring various ways to do that. Are you going to stay in the same kind of realm of, of work in the same Well, you see what market? I'm interested in. I'm interested yeah. <laughs> in interest rates and in bond issuance by the Federal Reserve, the, the uh, all of the government I think I know where you're going. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got a good sense. All right. There are a bunch of, uh, of questions. Um, 
All right, this is a good one. We've gotten a few questions on the role of cryptocurrency and central bank digital currency, uh, which is an area of focus at the Atlantic Council. What are the challenges and risks you see from these emerging financial technologies? And this issue is uh, debated uh, in every, so I've been in now G7 meetings and G20 meetings with world leaders since 2017. And so every meeting talks about this. Uh, and the, the competing needs are, if you have cryptocurrency that is uh, anonymous, you lose track of uh, of terrorism finance and some of the core issues that the international financial system is settled on. So there's there's clearly th some downsides to that. It's not clear what the value add proposition is of uh, of of currencies like Bitcoin, other than speed of speed of trading. How does it create a store of value? How does it really uh, uh, create a borrowing? You know, are there, are there users of that? That still has to be proven and, and explored. On the other hand, and so I'll be critical of, you know, central banks are, 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 are um, dominated by inertia, and that means slow settlement. So one of the things, so we've, we, World Bank, have taken two positions on this. One, how can central banks speed up their settlement process so that they're competitive with cryptocurrencies? So that, you know, I think it should be viewed as head-on competition between two different concepts of the world. And then the other thing we want from the World Bank standpoint is if the regulatory structure to be accessible by countries that don't have much capacity. If you have a very complicated regulatory structure on international tax or on international financial regulation, the poor countries lose out. They just can't afford the compliance costs of the systems that are being set up. That's a very real problem facing the countries. How do you reduce settlement plans? I mean, is it basically having uh, crypto coins for each of the central banks, like central bank issued crypto assets? The, they, they talk about uh, uh, central bank uh, digital currency. Right, right, digital currency. And so that's a buzzword, and some may do that, and then there'll be competition to see who's got the best one and the one that settles the or clears has the has the most dynamic markets underpinning it. So I think I I think that's more the desired direction of the world and we'll see if any of the central banks really pull it off. Just real quick before we move on, do you think that we're going to get a Fed coin in the next couple of years? Oh. Uh, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. They'll. They'll try to push on it. Very know. diplomatic. Yeah. All right. Very. Um, <laughs> this next question is: You've out, you've been outspoken about China's responsibilities in addressing the restructuring of its loans to developing countries. We were talking about the transparency recently. Beijing has complained that public criticism of its efforts have mm -hmm. slowed the restructuring mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. How do you respond? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to say it the other way. China sees the opportunity here, and there are it's, it doesn't take very much of a change. So, for example, one of the big sticking points right now is Zambia, the, the, and what is needed is a memorandum of understanding, an MOU, that just writes down what the restructuring agreement is that the various creditors have come to. Uh, so that's not a hard lift, and it's country that China has been supportive of for really for 40 years uh, in various ways. And so that's the step that's needed. It's not just China. It's also the private sector creditors. They've stood aside from this transparency process, debt reconciliation, and signing of MOUs. Chad had an MOU that was, they needed the private sector to sign the MOU, and it went on for months and months and months uh, waiting for the private sector creditors. Just put your name on this MOU. Well, there was a Wall Street Journal article a couple of weeks ago, or perhaps in the, ba in the past week or two, about how China was actually uh, relieving a bunch of debt, just simply eliminating it off the balance sheets of some of the Belt and Road Initiative countries, and that they actually were losing a lot of money. Can you confirm that? I mean, is that what you're hearing as well, that they're actually moving away from trying to seize collateral and just sort of saying, okay, we'll forgive this debt? Um, I want to be cautious on the word forgive. So, uh, you know, the one one uh, uh, question has been, is China taking collateral very often? And the answer is not very often. Uh, but, and there are very many different ways to do 
a debt relief for a country. You can reschedule way out into the future, which mm. provides a lot of breathing space for the country. My impression is that's more where, where the direction has been. Uh, but the, a challenge for the countries is you need light at the end of the tunnel. You need to have a period, a long period of years where new investors can come in without feeling they're going to have to pay the overhang of the old debt. So that's the restructurings that we're looking for. So I'm not, I, you know, China's been constructive. We've had a lot of relationships on this. So I don't agree with the, that, that point that was made in the question that uh, China wants people to lay off. Basically, they're looking for a way to have a constructive restructuring dialogue with the world. And they've been pretty clear about they would like to have more clarity on what the data is underneath the debt restructurings. Well, fair enough. And the world can come to them also with, uh, with a proposed way of doing business. They're the new entry, big new entry, that's uh, been engaged in the countries. So there's a little bit of burden on the world to say, look, we can do it differently. Let's find a way to make this work. And you think that things have gotten less opaque with China? Uh, so <laughs> the, 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 we're still working on, uh, on the transparency concepts. Okay. Um, here's another question. How has the World Bank managed this relationship with regional development banks? How do you ensure cohesion of purpose between the regional development banks and the World Bank? So regional development banks are the Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, AIIB, which is in Beijing, the uh, Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Um, and so we meet uh, twice a year. I meet with the heads of those organizations. And we all... Uh, uh, were founded, the, each one has different governance structures, so they're quite different institutions. I didn't mention African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank. There's a, there's a large group, so I apologize for those that I didn't yet name. Uh, European Bank for Reconstruction they're, they're all and complaining. Development. Don't worry. Uh, so they already feel e like they yeah, lost them. Each, each, one has a, <laughs> each one has a different board and some nuance in what their mission uh, statement is. And so we're, we're, uh, we're different institutions institutions, but all with, at some spot, a development purpose. So we want uh, people to do better in developing countries. So that gives us uh, things to talk about in terms of how we can do it. We all leverage differently. Uh, the World Bank is the most leveraged of those institutions, uh, which, we're, which we are happy to do, and that means that we can lend more because we are, we are leveraged, uh, uh, leveraged substantially. Can I take an aside on that? You know, the world has a tendency to put money into individual trust funds and fragment their d development assistance. The World Bank alone, or pretty much alone, is the one that can actually issue bonds against uh, 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 assistance that's going to the poorest countries. So where in the world is there a process where you can have people donate some money for the poorest countries, and then, the, and then who can then make it times three in terms of grants and loans to the poorest countries? Well, the World Bank is doing that every day. So we, we are issuing billions and billions of bonds from IDA from the, the arm of the World Bank that is a trust fund for the poorest countries. And so we're in the market almost every week with large scale borrowings for sustainable development into the poorest countries, which is uh, you know, a, 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 a unique part of the world financial system. We have time for one more question, and I think it's fitting to end on this one, which is how do you see the World Bank working with Ukraine, Ukraine ah. as it uh, begins reconstructing its nation whatever that happens. Yeah, the, the, it, it is fitting that we end. I mean, there's been a war for over a year. Early when, as Russia invaded, I, so I met with President Zelensky in February uh, of 2022, uh, we, just days before the Russian invasion. We committed uh, as, as a World Bank, we will be there to support because Ukraine had been a big client of the, of the World Bank. And we've continued that. We've done it in multiple ways. We lend directly. We have grants that, uh, uh, that, that go directly. And we also have been the major conduit by 
quickly setting up trust funds in March and April that were that, that of 2022 that were utilized uh, by the U.S., which has been a heavy contributor uh, to the to the to the uh, non-military support of Ukraine. Think of how are all the government workers, the hospital workers, the pensioners of Ukraine being sustained. And uh, so we've dispersed some, I don't know current, but $21 billion to Ukrainian government for non-military assistance over this period of time. And we've also then uh, helped chair the committees with the European Union, with the U.S., with other donors on uh, uh, the, the reconstruction effort. And so that takes what are you going to do on the electric grid, on generators, on uh, the, uh, the uh, roads and bridges that have been bombed purposely by Russia. And so the, the world is still working on where can those large amounts come from? We World Bank does the uh, the uh, kind of uh, the most noteworthy damage assessment. So we recently came out with that, and we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars uh, needed just to rebuild, just to get it back to where it was. And then, as you think about uh, the, the it going forward, my sense is that as Ukraine uh, works to become part of the European Union. That will be an important part of the guiding effort of how do you interlink with the European Union from markets and logistics standpoint. So we have uh, l large teams of uh, World Bank people working on that, but working closely with uh, U.S. and European David Malpass, thank you so much for a tremendous discussion and for your four years of service at the World Bank. Um, I look forward to finding out what your next endeavor uh, is. I want to uh, bring up Josh Lipsky for some final words. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank for, you, Lisa. Yeah, yeah thank thanks. you. And it's just a masterful conversation that took us through so much. So thank you for being here at the Atlantic Council today. And President Malpass, we are grateful that you came to the Atlantic Council ahead of the spring meetings to lay out your vision and the goals and the challenges facing the World Bank and the international financial community more broadly. Now, as Fred mentioned, this is only the start of World Bank IMF Week events at the Atlantic Council. Tomorrow, we welcome the IMF in the spirit of parity. Uh, to launch two analytical chapters of the forthcoming World Economic Outlook and Global Financial Stability Reports. Now, the papers focus on the economic cost of the world moving into geopolitical blocks, something we discussed today. There's some fascinating new data in there, so we hope everyone joins us tomorrow. After that, in the following week, we are proud to host a range of distinguished central bank governors and finance ministers from around the world here at the Atlantic Council, and we'll share all those invitations with everyone both here in this room and watching around the world. But I wanted to take this moment to close with something a little different. Today, the Geoeconomic Center is announcing its inaugural class of Bretton Woods Fellows. One year ago, standing here at Secretary Yellen's speech, we outlined this project. Today, it becomes a reality. We have brought together brilliant young economic thinkers from India, Slovakia, Ireland, Iran, Italy, Japan, and more. And over the next six months, on the road to the annual meetings in Marrakesh, we will work with them to produce new analysis on the future of the international financial system. Our goal here is to go beyond what you might normally expect from an economic center. It's not only about writing and research and analysis and events. Of course, it is about all of that. But it's about something more. We felt we needed to do something more. In the years following the Second World War, the US helped deliver what Henry Kissinger called a great burst of creativity. The World Bank and the IMF were critical parts of that creativity. If we are going to rediscover that spirit, we believe we have to engage young economic minds from around the world, work with them to help shape the system they want to see built. And that's our goal with the Bretton Woods Fellows and the entire Bretton Woods 2.0 project. And I hope all of you here and watching take the time to learn about their amazing backgrounds. I invite everyone to stay with us throughout IMF World Bank Week and the spring meetings and on the road to Marrakesh at the annual meetings. Thank you all for being with us today. Have a wonderful rest of the day.